are in listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network coordinated by NatureSurf. Um, and I'd like to welcome today our, our co-coordinators for this webinar, um, uh, Open Channels and Nick Wainer is, uh, is on from Open Channels uh, helping moderate the webinar. Um, we're very pleased today to be talking about the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment Tool for Coastal habit, Habitats, CVATCH, or CCVATCH. Get it right, um, and we have today with us um, two presenters and an additional question answerer. We have Jen Plunkett from the North Inlet Winya Bay near, uh, Robin Weber from the Narragansett Bay near, and also uh, Scott Lerberg from the Chesapeake Bay near is also on. He's been uh, integrally involved with the development and refinement of CC Vatch, and so uh, is also going to be available to answer questions at the end. Okay, uh, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know uh, how to ask questions. So there's two ways you can ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand, which is the little hand icon as your user interface. You can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you. We'll um, wait till the question and answer period period after the main presentation for um, audio questions like that. Um, or you can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface and I'll relay them to the presenters. Um, and in, for that you can send in questions at any point during the webinar. Um, and the substantive ones will hold till the end, uh, but if you have just quick clarifying questions, um, we can address some of those during the presentation itself. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll get started. Jen, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and I am really excited about the amount of interest and support we've received in our little CC Vatch tool. Uh, so I'll begin the talk today uh, with a general overview of what CC Vatch is, um, how it came about, and sort of the, what it's designed to do. Uh, and then Robin's going to talk about uh, more specifically how it's been impl implemented in the New England reserves. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about where our grand plan for the future of CC Batch, where we hope to go from here. So a little background in case you aren't familiar with the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Uh, it's a network of 28, soon to be 29, just got Hawaii, coastal sites. And they are designated to protect and study estuarine ecosystems uh, through research, stewardship, and education. Um, they were established through the Coastal Zone Management Act and they're a partnership program between NOAA and the coastal states, so NOAA provides uh, some funding and national guidance, but each site is uniquely managed uh, with a state partner, and so is able to address local needs. So today I am at uh, the North Inlet Winya Bay Reserve in South Carolina, located near Myrtle Beach, and Robin will be speaking from the Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, uh, Providence. So how this all got started uh, was about five years ago. Um, the reserves were becoming tasked with developing some method for assessing uh, the vulnerability of our habitats to climate change impacts. And so at, a national, at our national meeting we had in 2011, uh, the stewardship coordinators uh, were sitting around trying to think about some of the tools that were available uh, and how we were going to go about assessing vulnerability and we decided to form a little work group uh, to come up with either look at tools that existed or we started thinking about maybe what we needed was to develop our own tools. So there are a lot of really good tools out there at that point already, but they were mostly designed around assessing the vulnerability of individual species or some of the habitat ones out there didn't explicitly take into account sea level rise, which as estuarine ecosystems was of a primary concern to us. So we started working on developing a tool that we thought would meet our needs as primarily habitat managers in coastal systems. Uh, we worked up something we thought was pretty good. Uh, we called it CC Vetch. And in 2013, we got some funding from the Near Science Collaborative to test it out uh, at two pilot sites, and one in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, and one down here at North Inlet Winya Bay in South Carolina. And the, in the pilot studies, we brought together local land managers and experts. We had them test the tool process and the facilitation process. Uh, we had them provide feedback on you know, what was in the tool, the use of the tool, how they thought the facilitation went, 
and also had some pretty good discuss discussions about potential uses of the tool, how they saw applying it to uh, land management decisions and for uh, planning in the light of climate change. Uh, we revised the tool itself. We made some changes to what was in it. Uh, we updated the guidance documents based on the participants' feedback from those two pilot studies. And now currently, uh, the New England uh, sites, Robin has received a national uh, uh, near science collaborative, what they call a transfer grant, uh, to start using the CCVATCH to do assessments across habitats in the four New England reserves. And she'll be talking a little bit more uh, about that project today. And just recently, we got word that we also received a similar uh, transfer grant to do a similar kind of project with the North Carolina Reserves and North Inlet Winya Bay. And we are looking uh, more directly at uh, comparing vulnerabilities between intertidal marshes uh, across the four components of the North Carolina site and at North Inlet Winya Bay. So going back to our initial 2011 work group, uh, when we started out, we didn't really we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There had already been a lot of uh, good work done on looking at frameworks, developing frameworks for vulnerability assessments. So we went back to uh, this basic model that was established in the Scanning the Conservation Horizon uh, work that was uh, promoted by the National Wildlife Federation. And so in this model, you have exposure, which would be the climate change and climate conditions. Uh, combining with sensitivities, which would be the innate habitat characteristics that may or may not make that habitat respond to a particular exposure. And those combine to form the potential impact. Uh, the potential impact can then be possibly be ameliorated by adaptive capacity, which would be the inherent characteristics of the habitat that uh, would make it ecologically resilient to change, or it could also be management actions that could increase the resiliency. So what was important of particular interest to us was the fact that vulnerability of the habitat is not just a product of climate change, uh, but also is affected by the current conditions of the climate, as well as potential management actions in that climate. So we wanted to develop a tool that would help us to examine sources of vulnerability for defined habitat types and areas, uh, but also need to generate results that would be directly applicable to management decisions that we have to make today. We started out, we said, well, we know that habitats are directly influenced by climate changes or climate stressors, so this would be the exposures. And for the purposes of this tool, we narrowed it down to five general categories of a change in CO2, a change in precipitation, change in air and, and water temperatures, a change in sea level, and a change in uh, severity or frequency of extreme climate events. And that means like tropical storms, northeasters, or a severe prolonged drought. But additionally, we also know from our experience that our habitats are already being affected by other stressors or non-climate stressors. So these could be thought of as, as, as the sensitivities of the habitat. Um, we refer to these often as non-climate stressors. Uh, after a lot of debate uh, with, between our, amongst ourselves and with input from researchers and land managers both inside and outside of the reserve system, we gathered a lot of input. We came down to five uh, non-climate stressors that we felt were the most pertinent to the habitats we manage, the ones that seem to come up the most often and have the greatest effects. So for this tool, they are invasives or nuisance species, nutrients, sedimentation, erosion, and contamination. Well, it's further complicated because we also recognize that not only does climate impact the habitat and stressors impact the habitat, but climate is also potentially could have an impact directly on the stressors themselves. So for example, a, a stressor could be made uh, increased in severity or increased in how widespread the effect is by changes to climate. So as far as I know, uh, the CCVATCH is different from other vulnerability assessment tools. And that it's, it is designed specifically to address not only 
direct climate effects on the habitat, but also how each climate and non-climate stressor may interact to impact the habitat. And we also do include adaptive capacity within this analysis. Um, so what we included in adaptive capacity were both inherent traits to the ecosystem and also external factors. So for example, ecological traits such as quick regeneration time um, and the ability to disperse or migrate easily uh, would naturally facilitate uh, resiliency within a habitat. Um, it's also generally true that habitats that are less fragmented spatially um, that have greater species diversity are more stable over time. But additionally, ex external factors such as whether or not the habitat is or could be managed to promote resilience and also how likely humans are to actually take those management actions uh, will affect how vulnerable overall the habitat is. So how does this whole CC Vetch tool actually work? Well, it's, it's, we call it a tool, but really I have come to think of it more as a CC Vetch process. That's based on a facilitated expert elicitation. So probably one of the most important steps in using this tool is making sure you bring the right people to the table. Um, you have to gather a, a group of local experts who know something about the habitat that you're assessing. So these should include a good mix of, for example, a site manager, uh, maybe someone who is not a manager at that particular site but manages similar habitats, um, biologists, they can be university biologists or organizational biologists, and also you want to have um, people who are maybe not directly knowledge experts but who are very interested in what the outcomes of the study would be. You'd also want to have them at the table from the beginning. So for example, in almost all of our pilots we had land trust representatives uh, participating. And you also want to have a good facilitator. And so the general idea is that you get these people around the table um, and then they come together and they discuss what they believe would be the potential impact on the habitat of the climate and environmental stressors through a facilitated process. And this process is outlined in the CC Vetch guidance document that we have developed and that is available on our website. So the team frames the results of this discussion um, as numerical scores that are then entered into a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet then calculates an overall vulnerability score for each habitat assessed. The idea being the team can then take that vulnerability score, uh, look at where the sources of vulnerability were, and go back and discuss what some potential management actions might be based on that score. Um, and note that the numerical scores are not absolute meaning that if someone is using CCVETCH in Maine um, on an intertidal salt marsh, they might get a final score of, say, 39. Um, but that would not be the same as if someone in Georgia was using this on a dune system and got a score of 39. You can't directly compare. A 39 doesn't mean have an absolute meaning. It's more of an internal uh, relative vulnerability score. So you could use it to study the relative vulnerability of different habitats within one reserve or you could use it to study the relative vulnerability of different parcels of the same kind of habitat across a region. Is that a score out of 100, someone asked? Um, Robin, what's the highest? Robin on? I, yeah, I guess it is out of, yeah, it is out of 100. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thanks. So this is what this spreadsheet looks like. Uh, it's a screenshot. So it's just an Excel spreadsheet. It's available through our website, ccvetch.com. Um, and so the way it works is a team considers each uh, exposure sensitivity interaction separately. And they determine the degree to which they believe the interaction will impact the habitat's ability um, to pers persist. So basically the goal is to enter a numerical score that represents the severity of the interaction in each box. And then the spreadsheet calculates uh, an overall vulnerability based on the scores entered. And yes, there are 36 boxes <laughs> that need to be filled out for each habitat. But as you know, Robin will discuss, and as you'll see, it's not likely that your team would actually have to fill in uh, numerical responses for all 36 boxes. In some cases, it may just not be something you need to consider 
uh, for example, although coastal is in our title, uh, we put that in to signify that the tool was designed to be able to incorporate sea level rise, but it doesn't necessarily have to. You could certainly use this tool on upland habitats that are not affected by sea level. You would just simply not fill in that column when you were doing the analysis. In other cases, you know, some answers boxes will be really easy to fill in. You'll know the answers right away. Uh, really, the ones that are going to require more extensive review, it's, it's going to be less than 36. So what are these scores that we're talking about? Well, in the guidance document, we do provide uh, numerical scoring levels. Uh, they're different for the current conditions of the habitat, the severity of the exposure sensitivity interaction, and then the potential for adaptive capacity. So, for example, for sensitivity exposure, there are cases where the habitat might actually benefit from a non-climate stressor. For example, increased precipitation might help to ameliorate a nutrient problem that you're having in the habitat. So, in those cases, the habitat would actually receive a negative, negative two score. If there's no anticipated change, just you cannot conceive of how this change in climate would actually affect the stressor, then it would have a score of zero. You could also have a low to moderate impact, would be a score of 2 to 5. Uh, and then we put in a 10 for those rare cases where you, you know that if that climate exposure interaction did occur to the degree that you're predicting it will, that would mean a complete loss of habitat. For example, something like a low-lying salt marsh with one foot of sea level rise. You can say, well, that's pretty much going to wipe out the whole habitat if that happens. Uh, we do suggest these levels of negative 2, 0, 2, 5, and 10, but in the spreadsheet you actually can enter in any intermediate number that you would like. So if your team thinks, well, it's a little bit more than a 2, but I'm not really willing to give it a 5, they can actually give it a 3. And in our pilot studies, we came to these scoring decisions by group consensus. Uh, so we had about 5 to 8 people uh, for each pilot. And it was a pretty uh, local, friendly group. And so we were able to come to these scores by consensus. But you could also do like an averaging of all the group or a majority voting. Uh, it's just important that you establish from the start how you're actually going to reach these scoring decisions. And really important in the tool, I think one of the valuable uh, aspects of the tool is that you do provide for each score the group gives, you do provide a certainty score. And so that's based on how much evidence you have, how much expertise you think you have in the room, and also you know, how much the available literature agrees on what the potential outcomes might be. Now you can also use a certainty score we found as a flagging mechanism. So as your, your uh, assessment team is working through this process, you might come across something where you say, well, you know, I just really don't know what the situation is, for example, with chemical contaminants at this site. We really, we've never looked into it. We don't have anyone in the room who's an expert. We really need to revisit this so we can better understand it. So you could put in a zero for that certainty score, and then later when you're going back and looking at the overall assessment results, those zeros will stand out and they'll tell you where you might want to further follow up and find some more information out about your habitat. And then to further help with the scoring, in the guidance document, we do provide for each climate stressor interaction, we do provide a little bit of background information. Um, and then we have a few assessment questions, which are kind of like food for thought questions. They might not be directly relevant to the habitat you're assessing, but they're more designed to sort of get the ball rolling around the discussion, to sort of help the facilitator out in the room. And then we also provide uh, scoring examples for each interaction. So again, they might not be directly re relevant to the habitat you're assessing, but they're kind of meant to get us all on the same page about, for example, what a low impact might be compared to a moderate impact compared to a severe impact. So that if different teams are applying this tool in different habitats, there should be some consistency in how they're thinking about the scoring so that we can maybe compare those scores uh, in the end. So the guidance, um, you can think about the CCVETCH process, visualize it as a sort of a grid of boxes uh, that you're basically trying to fill in with relevant information about the potential impacts 
of climate and non-climate stressors uh, and their impacts on habitat function. So now the big question is, where does this information come from to fill in the answers in all of these boxes? Before you get to that, there's a couple of things you need to do in the tool. Uh, one is you need to define the habitat area. Uh, each habitat assessed it should be a defined area that has similar exposures and stressors, and it's important that's under one or similar management regimes. So, for example, the example I give here is of a maritime shrub or secondary dune habitat uh, within North Inlet Reserve. So this particular patch of dune habitat, there are a lot more patches along the coast and south of this one. This particular patch is right up against a developed area. It's a golf course community. That's also experiencing high erosion rates because there are some uh, groin structures, up current, up drift of it. Further south, there is another patch of dune habitat that is in a very protected area. It's not experiencing high erosion rates. It doesn't have any human, uh, direct human impact on it. So I could just assess the vulnerability of all dunes, secondary dunes within the North Inlet Reserve, but I know that these different parcels have some different things going on within them. So while the climate exposures is, is probably the same across both these habitats, right? They're within a couple of kilometers of each other. There, I already know that there are differences in the sensitivities of these individual patches. So therefore, I might want to assess them as separate patches. Also, I could do maybe what I want my question is how are the dunes habitat's vulnerability compared to the maritime forest that is directly behind it compared to the intertidal salt marsh that's directly behind that. So you can also use it to compare across different habitat types, which might give you some information on, you know, if there are common stressors across all three that maybe you could uh, help out with one kind of a management change in management. Uh, and also where to direct your resources to if you have you know one particular habitat that's really popping out is much more vulnerable than other habitats. You might want to make some decisions about how you're managing that habitat in comparison. The next thing you need to do is you need to define the time frame and the scenario. Uh, for the pilot studies, our groups tended to feel that a typical management time frame was about 30 years, so that was far enough out that we expect to start seeing real climate changes impacting our habitats, but not too far out to actually conceive about how we would manage, uh, make management decisions. And so I just want to note that the CCVETCH guidance does not, we don't recommend a specific time frame or scenario uh, because we recognize that, that users might be constrained on, uh, to using specific models uh, or scenarios based on either their location or their funding or their particular management needs. So once you've acquired climate predictions, um, the next once you've decided on your climate change scenarios, the next step is to acquire climate predictions. And we noted that um, you don't need really specific climate data to use this tool. We ended up using data from the USGS National Climate Change Viewer, uh, which I then compiled for our group by season, since it's typically seasonal changes are more important ecologically than, than average annual changes. And then if appropriate, if you're working in, in habitats that will be affected by sea level, you need to get some sea level rise predictions. Um, and again, this tool could easily be used for an upland habitat. You just would simply ignore that column in the spreadsheet. And then you might want to gather up just some visualizations for your, for your group. We found these to be really helpful when we were sitting down. They helped to frame our discussion a little bit. So again, how are we filling in these boxes? And so as an illustration uh, of some of the kinds of tools that might be used to fill in these boxes, I was going to go through maybe a, few, a little bit of the information that we would use if we were doing the dunes example that I gave earlier. So for example, uh, beginning with invasives, presumably if we had people in the room who knew about this particular dune habitat, they would also be familiar with the plant beach vitex, which is an invasive uh, that's spread up and down along the coast. Uh, they would know that it can cause severe erosion pro pro problems. So they might want to say, well, let's start by looking at where uh, known locations are. And so there's an application, the University of Georgia EdMaps application um, provides information on reports of where these invasive species have occurred. 
And so we might go to EdMaps, we might say, well, there's been 57 reports very close to our habitat. And this also helps you get at some local knowledge because you can go in and see who actually made that report. And then the group, your assessment team might want to contact that person if they had further questions. In this case, it was me. So I'm pretty familiar with this record. There are also a lot of state resources that are out there that will help us to fill in some of these boxes. Uh, for example, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control has a watershed atlas. Uh, it's a mapping application that shows, um, it shows where water quality monitoring stations are uh, and also where permits have been issued. Um, and that might provide some information to the team on potential nutrient issues. So for example, for this site, we can see that in the community development directly north of our dune site, they do, uh, they do have an application for applying tertiary wastewater to their golf courses. So that might, you know, may or may not be an issue with nutrients that we would want to consider in this analysis. Uh, they also have a beachfront jurisdiction web mapping application uh, which provides current erosion rates and also information on uh, where the beach has been stabilized. So again, that might help to fill in that box when you're wondering, uh, assessing the severity of erosion at your, your particular site. And there's several nationally available resources that would provide data to fill in some more of the boxes. For example, the NOAA flood exposure mapper. Um, you can use it to look at potential pollution sources. So if your assessment team didn't really know if there were some potential pollution sources in the area, they might want to check this out and see how close they are. Um, and this, this data doesn't give you, necessarily tell you if the contamination has occurred um, or what degree it might have impacted the habitat, but it might alert your assessment team to the presence of potential sources of contamination that they might want to further follow up on. You can also overlay um, sea water rise and storm events, storm floods on this to see if there might be a potential interaction between an increase in sea level or an increase in the severity of storms with uh, contaminants in the area. And then another tool that I have kind of just come across, I haven't had a whole lot of time to explore, but it seems like it would be a wealth of data, is the uh, Coastal Change Hazards Portal. So again, this provides not only some good visualizations, uh, but it seems to provide pretty extensive information on data sources, so you might, your team might want to follow up on some of this information to help fill in that question about how sea level and extreme climate might affect sedimentation and erosion. And then depending on the expertise available to your group and also the detail of data you feel you need to answer these questions, you could use more technical modeling processes to get at filling in the answers in some of these boxes. So for example, uh, NSPEC, the um, non-point source pollution and erosion comparison tool uh, simulates erosion and pollution um, and it calculates the accumulation from overland flow. So you could use this tool to investigate uh, potential impacts from climate change such as change in the intensity of precipitation. And then there is the good old literature search and we have relied a lot um, on the template for assessing climate change impacts and management options. Um, and this is a really great tool because it's, um, it's an online database that compiles literature on climate change predictions, uh, impacts and management options. It has resource management plans in there and then it gives you sort of a synthesized output based on your user-defined criteria. For, so for example, I found 28 records having to do with the general impacts of carbon dioxide on invasive species. So in presenting our tool, I've spent a lot of time in talking about other tools, which may seem a little bit odd, but that's to illustrate that what the CC Batch is really doing is it's functioning as a support tool for sorting out uh, the numerous types of information, data sources, modeling, um, and other tools that are already available out there that an individual that, that may individually contribute to little pieces of information to the big picture. And so this is basically a way of how can you fit all of these different sources of data together to come up with one generalized understanding of how your habitat may be vulnerable to climate changes. It's also useful in highlighting which boxes are not filled in. Um, and in some cases, these may represent real data gaps out there that could help to direct 
uh, focus future climate research. And so this is a little screenshot of what my dunes example might look like all filled in. Um, and you'll note that, for example, I didn't fill in any of the CO2 columns. So this might represent if I had a group that sat down and said, you know what, we don't have an expert about CO2. There isn't a lot of literature about CO2 out there. We know we're just going to be giving really low certainty scores for everything that we could potentially answer. So you know, we're just not going to consider CO2 in this analysis. And that's fine because the way the tool computes the score, it has an adjusted score, which takes into account boxes that are not filled in. And this is what the adaptive capacity section would look like. And for adaptive capacity, a higher score is actually better. Uh, so it's sort of like you're assigning bonus points to the habitat for uh, characteristics that will promote resiliency. And this is what the final score would look like for the dunes example. Um, it came out, although it had a moderate exposure sensitivity, it had a very low adaptive capacity. So overall, it came out with a high vulnerability score. And by comparison, these are the results of the pilot studies, all the sites that we did in the pilot studies. So you can see that we actually did get a spread of results from very low vulnerability to very high vulnerability. I was a little worried when we started that pilot process that it was all going to be a wash, that everything was going to come out to be moderately vulnerable. But this tool did actually demonstrate that it is useful in um, separating out habitats from very low to very high vulnerabilities. So with that, if there are any like really burning clarification questions, um, I could take those now. But otherwise, we're going to move on to Rob, and he's going to talk to you a little bit more about the New England study that's going on right now. OK, I just switched. Uh, Thank you. Rob and <laughs> OK, so um, thanks, Jen. And thanks to everybody for joining in today. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the process of applying CC match. And these five basic steps are appropriate really for all applications. So you would first want to define your goals and um, questions to be addressed, identify available data sources and literature to be reviewed, compile all that information, which is no small feat, um, into a format suitable for use in scoring, and then hold your facilitated meetings. And finally, you'll want to apply those results to support your management decisions. And I will be illustrating this process for a current ongoing project at two different scales, um, a regional collaborative effort, as well as the local application of CCVAT in Rhode Island. So regionally, we have shared the initial um, tasks of gathering resources and training. Um, and when we're all said and done, um, we'll also be sharing outreach product development. For the regional project, um, and this is funded, as Jen mentioned, through the NEAR Science Collaborative Grant, the goals and the specific questions to be addressed remain site-specific. The five national estuarine research reserves that are participating in this project include Wells, Maine, Great Bay, New Hampshire, Wacoit Bay, Massachusetts. And at those locations, they're still in the project planning phase. Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, um, we've already begun to apply the tool in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, which is providing support based on experiences with their pilot project. So these tasks, which as you probably noticed, are the bulk of um, applying CCVAT, uh, identifying, reviewing, and compiling relevant resources is really kind of iterative, at least within this regional project. So the reserves have already shared the task um, of identifying information sources and data needs and compiled the draft Northeast resource document focused primarily on salt marshes, um, but we hope to move into other habitats as well. And this was done really early on in the first months after receiving our grant award. Reserves will then work with local partners to apply CC batch at their sites and new information sources and data 
are then folded back into the draft Northeast resource document. And as I mentioned, Narragansett Bay has already started their assessment and have made um, huge contributions to this resource document already. And it's to be expected as the other reserves begin their assessments um, this fall that they'll be adding even more information um, that they uh, have knowledge of that we didn't um, back into this resource document so that um, when the resource document is finalized and distributed upon um, project completion, which we anticipate to occur um, before, hopefully, August 2017, that document will then represent the current state of knowledge regarding climate change impacts on assessed habitats in the Northeast. Um, project support for this component of the CC Bounch application process at the regional scale is really more stepwise in nature. Um, all participating reserve staff benefit from shared training and facilitation opportunities, including the available um, Office of Coastal Management trainings. We offered one in Rhode Island in October, and they hosted one in Maine in, in January of this year. Um, as well as shared training and tool applications just through the participation um, at other reserves. So we'll be traveling back and forth a little bit to help each other out. How the scores will be applied at the different reserves is really dependent upon the goals unique to each. Um, however, they will likely fall into one or more of the following general categories. So. Uh, certainly management and restoration planning, prioritizing acquisition areas, education outreach, policy and funding guidance, as well as the identification of additional research needs. We anticipate the following outreach products for the Northeast, um, as previously mentioned, a regional state of knowledge resource document, um, case studies based on individual reserve applications of the tool, fact sheets to inform coastal decision makers, um, and finally a posted list of research needs that we're very hopeful will influence funding agencies. So looking at the same process steps as they relate to the application of CC Batch in Rhode Island, um, in order to set our goals here, um, and specific questions. We first held an initial project planning workshop at which we reviewed the tool, discussed the larger Northeast project, and also planned for the Rhode Island component. Um, we used an ecological community classification layer available from the state's GIS files in order to vote on the habitats to be assessed. And as Salt Marsh was the clear winner, um, we opted to first apply the tool to salt marsh habitat, and we may progress to, to other habitats. Um, and as time permits, to assess as many of the 39 salt marshes um, for which site-specific field data was available. And those data were derived through a rapid assessment monitoring protocol um, that was conducted in 2012 and 2013 which basically gives you an overall, you know, are they are good shape, bad shape, um, et cetera, kind of a range of scales across the state. The next two steps in the process were initiated at a team pre-meeting to identify available data sources, reference material, and experts from which to elicit additional information. And the initial source material to generate these lists included the CC Batch document, as well as the draft resource document generated by the Northeast Reserve staff. Um, we then used roving flip charts. Um, the Rhode Island assessment team generated a bulleted list of these and other. Um, there was a lot of information from the team itself. Um, as to what resources were available. And then individuals on the team volunteered to review this material and reach out to experts. That reviewed content was then folded back into the draft resource document, which is significantly larger than it, was, than it started as. Um, and this was used to generate a bu bulleted list 
of anticipated impacts for use in scoring. And I'll refer to this impacts list um, as I go on in the process here. So armed with um, all the identified and collected support material, um, most of which Jen mentioned, certainly climate projections for the area, uh, local estimations of sea level rise. And I should note that we had a fair amount of discussion about what our end date or our time frame for assessment should be. And we agreed um, largely because we're not all that familiar with uh, climate models to go with a kind of an average climate model or an average across climate models um, and also to adopt the NOAA sea level curves which suggest um, a two foot increase in sea level for that time period by 2050 for our area. And other support material included um, the draft resource document, obviously, the CCVATCH guidance, plus all its component pieces, the worksheets, the scoring levels, and then, you know, as Jen mentioned, pretty much every map we could get our hands on that we thought would um, be relevant for use during scoring. So examples include shoreline change, land cover um, on the surface of the salt marsh as well as adjacent land cover, SLAM model output, contaminant sources. Um, and then, you know, armed with all that material, we then began the scoring process. And um, that initial scoring session really provided a great opportunity to revisit and revise the bulleted impacts list that we made in the step before. Um, primarily to debate the potential effects. So, for example, um, just because we're aware that a change in temperature may influence contaminant uptake, right, um, we didn't necessarily agree that two degree anticipated change in temperature was enough of a trigger to see that response in our habitat. So, you know, lots of discussion um, for that first go-round, for that first scoring effort. And so following that first full, you know, set of scoring, we then um, used an online survey to, to streamline the scoring process somewhat for additional site assessment. And recall um, our initial target was 39 sites, so we needed to make that this as straightforward as we could make it. Um, and this effort, the survey and a follow-up call, allowed us to agree which characteristics of a specific site determine a change in response to climate. Um, so what is it about the location that, that is different site to site to site? And also which question responses would not vary site to site? Um, so for example, again, um, if carbon dioxide is known to have a dis differential impact on C3 and C4 plants, we felt that that would be equally true of all sites um, as the increase in carbon dioxide levels across this little state of Rhode Island is basically a constant. Um, so those sorts of discussions, those sorts of questions um, resolved through the survey and call. Uh, the output or the outcome of that effort is a handout reflecting the impacts um, the original impacts bullets or revised impacts bullets actually, um, as well as factors to consider when scoring additional locations as we proceed. And so just a little bit more detail here. There's, this is a similar um, spreadsheet to what Jen had showed before. You can see that our scores for our first site, which happened to be Chase Cove, are listed. But then you also see a lot of boxes that are kind of grayed out or or um, pre-assigned scores. Um, and why is that? Well, for, for example, if you look under direct effects and precipitation, our investigation suggests that a change in groundwater level impacts both marsh elevation as well as the degree of saltwater intrusion. All right, so this is true. We know that to be true. However, we don't have the data. Um, available to capture that variation between sites. We just don't know what the ground, relative groundwater levels are. 
at different locations. So until we do have that information, we agreed that all sites would be scored the same based on other um, bullet, bullets on the precipitation direct effects list um, and kind of hold that one aside until that information becomes available. Um, another example, you can see here that under invasive nuisance species and carbon dioxide, our intent then is to assign one score if Phragmites is present and then zero if it's not. So in our investigations, in our review of the reference material, um, this score, the 1.6, um, is, and I'm sorry, I, sh I should have not, I sh it should have been a straight 1.6 in that first um, block box, but uh, that's really based on the response of Phragmites to, car to an increase in carbon dioxide. So um, one score of Phragmites is present, one score if it's not. For sedimentation and temperature, um, we couldn't find any published literature to indicate any interaction effect exists. So we're not going to assign a score for that block, not only for Chase Cove, for all, but for all future sites, until we discover that uh, there is an interaction uh, at some later date. And then finally, for environmental contaminants and carbon dioxide, um, we did assign a, zero, a score of zero for Chase Cove um, because there are no contaminants present. Um, but this may change for sites at which there is a proximate source of contaminants. And, or we could decide later that um, an increase in carbon dioxide effect you know, the extent to which that happens for, um, or all just contaminant mobility is so largely unknown that we can't score. The point being here is that we haven't actually had that conversation yet, and so that's kind of a placeholder, um, and we'll need to have that discussion when we begin to assess, assess a site that does have a local contaminant source. Um, one thing to bear in mind here is that as you're progressing through the tool, it does help to keep really nice notes um, so you're sure where there's, what these scores came from um, so that, you know, as you progress through the tool for different sites, you need to revisit that debate and that discussion every single time. Um, and you've already seen this last, but um, the application of the final scores is somewhat really dependent on the agency and the focus of the various team members. So here in Rhode Island, um, for many team members, the application of CCBatch will directly support management and restoration planning. But for others, <clears throat> they're really more interested in identifying areas for protection. Um, and for other folks in the, in, on the team, um, their primary interest is to support funding and policy decisions. So again, one, one goal, which was really to um, assess the relative vulnerability of salt marsh in the state of Rhode Island, um, multiple people on the team, and potentially multiple applications of the tool, depending on who they are. And that's all for me, Sarah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let's see, so um, we'll go into questions now. Oh, I have did a you have few, anything to add, Jennifer? Yeah, yeah go ahead. more slides and we could put it back to you. Oh, sorry. Me. Okay. Oh, I forgot the plan. Just uh, the grand plan yeah. slides. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, you know, where are we going from here? Just really quickly, we mentioned the Northeast project you just heard about from Robin. Uh, and I also mentioned that we're going to be doing a similar process between North Carolina uh, and North Winnipeg Bay. There's also been some talk of uh, Scott. Scott has agreed to do a similar process in the Chesapeake Bay reserves, uh, and there's been some talk of doing maybe a Gulf-wide assessment. So that's within the reserve systems. Um, but we're also interested in working with partners outside the reserve. We would really love to see the supply by uh, other land managers, fish and wildlife. Um, 
any other uh, privately owned land managers. Uh, really, we're interested in working with with anyone who might see a useful application for this this project. And also, you know, why I'm excited about presenting to you all today as the tools network is we need help with filling in these boxes. So we've you know we've made a good start at filling in what some of the sources of information might be for addressing these questions. But I know there's tons more tools out there that I'm just not aware of. So that's something that we'd like a little help. You know, eventually I would love to see some sort of a web resource where someone using this tool might say, you know, I really do need more information on how temperature might affect sedimentation. Is there anything out there that can help me? Hopefully they could go to something that looks like this, click on the temperature sedimentation box, and up would pop a list of resources, literature, tools that might help you to address that, that issue at your site. Uh, and then we're continuing to build out the website. So right now, if you go to the website, it's what you see. We have the guidance document, the scoring worksheet, um, a little bit about how it works. But we really want to continue to build out this resource list. Um, we'll also be putting up case studies as we have them so that people can look to them for examples of how to apply a CC vetch and also how the results might be used. So that's the grand plan. And we'd love to take any questions. OK, great. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, all right, we do have questions. And uh, probably the questions we have um, will, will get us to the end of the webinar. Uh, but if anybody has any additional ones, um, I'm able to, to provide the, the questions to uh, Jennifer and Robin and Scott. So they will see the questions. Uh, so if you want to keep sending them. OK, um, let's see. There was a question, as part of management actions, do you anticipate county local disaster mitigation planners using the output of this tool to influence disaster mitigation planning and grant processes? If so, can you provide an example of how the tool might be used to influence community disaster mitigation strategies? Scott, did you have some people at your pilots who were more on the no, unfortunately we didn't. We had some discussion about TMDLs, but not disaster planning. Okay. Robin, any thoughts? Well, I, d I do think that um, there are folks on our team who's really um, very interested in like the potential for migration and uh, the possibility of even um, putting like large protective buffers behind some of the habitats that we would be assessing. So I guess that feeds in, but not, um, it's not a clear to one one. Um. And the tool is meant to assess ecological habitats and not um, built infrastructure. But I could see if you know that you have like a dune system that's vital in protecting your community, then you might want to use the tool to look at the vulnerabilities of the dune system. Um, and then if there are management actions you could be taking today to promote the resiliency of the dune system, then that might get at uh, ameliorating potential disaster situations, hazard situations. Okay. I don't have a really specific example of where it's been used to, to look at that, though. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. There's, oh, there's lots of good ones. Um, uh, well, here's a quick one. Uh, how many participants did you try to include in each facilitated exercise? We um, basically, so we started out with a, a announcement, a big introduction workshop, and we invited everyone we could think of to it. Um, and then from that workshop, we invited you know the people who would be most interested in each specific pilot site. So for us. Our community is fairly small. Um, there's not, you know, was, you kind of tend to work with like the same 10 people on every project around here. So it was a little bit different, whereas like Chesapeake Bay, they have a much larger community, a lot more people working on Chesapeake Bay issues. So for us, for the actual pilot studies, the, the people we had sitting around the table, I think that ranged from five to eight for each pilot study. And then Scott, was yours similar? Yours was about similar, right? That was, that, exactly, that was about the exact same numbers we had as well. Right. So and it wasn't that we only selected five to eight. It was just sort of that's what came out of it. But we found that was actually a really good sized group to work with when you're trying to come to consensus. Probably if you had any more than like 10 in the room, it would start to get difficult to come to consensus on these scores. OK, great. Thank you. Um, 
Another question, how will the group track and understand how the tool and its results are being used? We're wrestling with this for other vulnerability assessments. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that's something that, you know, we have been talking about and, you know, right now we feel like we're still trying to get it out there, but we would like to, through this sort of website, building this um, sort of resource website, and so one way of tracking it is if we see people are contributing a lot of really useful resources that they're coming across, that might be some indication of how many people are using it and how they're using it. And then we also hope that people will contribute these case studies uh, to the website. So if you do use it and you do find you know, it has applications to your management issues, then you know, please you know, we'll have you write up a case study and submit it to the website. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we had one comment, it said, not really a question, but I wanted to call your attention to the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment, recently completed by a large group of cooperative partners associated with the landscape conservation cooperatives. This took a more species and systems level approach, but may be worth exploring prior to designing an assessment along the Gulf of Mexico. Right, and we, so we did have uh, one of the initial developers, Kirsten Stanzel, was at uh, Mission Aransas Reserve, and she was actually involved in that process as well. Uh, she's since left the system, but we did have her as a go-between, so we were aware that that was going on. And that's definitely something uh, we're going to be looking to when uh, we start to think about developing a golf assessment. Okay, great. Um, do you have examples of implementation of CC Vatch out method outside the U.S.? No, not outside the U.S., not that I know of. We haven't gotten that far yet. Okay, all right. Well, sounds like there's some interest. Um, Let's see, uh, have you connected with any companies like ProQuest or publishers for their data? I haven't, Robin. No. Any... No, I have not. Okay. Um, and there are some questions about non-climate stressors. Um, I'll start with the first one. Uh, did the group consider human disturbance or physical disturbance as one of the non-climate distressors, or non-climate stressors? Is the marine in the marine environment, bottom trawling, for example, can be a significant source of disturbance impacts on marine benthic habitats in some areas. Not sure about terrestrial analogies, grazing, question mark. So we get asked a lot about, you know, where is the human impact or where is development it comes up a lot too, because that's much, very uh, significant impact in this area. And the way we were thinking about it is we're looking at the specific stressors themselves, not the cause of the stressors. So for example, nutrients are a stressor to a lot of our systems. Well, the cause of nutrients typically is human development or it could be like a wildlife issue too. Um, typically the causes of excess sediment coming into a system have to do with things that are going on in the human system. For example, something like changes in grazing. Uh, other changes in land use, changes from agriculture to development will affect sedimentation. So while the tool does not explicitly state human impact or human development, uh, it's more looking at but what is the actual stressor on the habitat regardless of what is contributing to causing that stressor, if that makes sense. Yes, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, let's do one last question. Um, what is the timeline for assessing future conditions? Um, in terms of how far out you're looking with the climate I, I think that's Yeah, I think that's what they're yeah, going So for. again, we didn't, we don't prescribe that in the tool. Uh, we left that up to the users. So uh, for our pilots, we tended to look out 30 years. Um, but I think in Scott's pilots, they actually tested, compared, looking at what, 50 years and 100 years? I think it was 30 and 100 in a couple of the cases, yes. Okay. Yeah. Just to see, you know, if that if looking out, looking at 100 years, you get more significant climate impacts, but then thinking about management actions 100 years out, there's so much that's an unknown about how we actually will be able to manage habitat. So it really depends on, on what your questions are, uh, who the users of the tool are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you coming on and talking about CC Batch. There was obviously a lot of interest, and I hope uh, you get a lot more uh, uh, case studies of its use um, for development and for for the actual outcomes. Um, yeah, we really really appreciate you being on, and I'd like uh, 
I'd like to thank all of you, and, and I just also wanted to thank everyone else who was able to attend. We really appreciate you coming to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, have a great afternoon, everyone.